Hey friends and foes, welcome to Brushwork Podcast. My name is Stephanie Scott, and today I've got an artist interview with Ashwini Sadakar. In our conversation today, we talk about the science of color, being a yogi, teaching art, habits for good creative practices, burning out, and much, much more. I think you're going to like this discussion with Ashwini. Her art is vivid and bright. You're going to see links to it in the show notes, or you can see the beautiful pictures here on screen if you're listening on YouTube. If you like the podcast today, I would love it if you could like and subscribe it. If you could leave it a follow or a five-star rating, all that jazz, it helps me meet more artists and find more artists to interview here for you. Without further ado, here's the interview with Ashwini. Welcome to the podcast. Thank you. I'm so glad to have you here on Brushwork today. I've met Ashwini. We met each other two years ago, three years ago. I feel like I've known you for a couple of years now through our mutual coach, how do I describe Brittany? Our social media coach that we had mutually for a while, whose name is Brittany Torres. And we met through one of her programs together, I think. Is that correct? Yes. Yes. It was very fun. And uh, I feel like Brittany has transformed both of our lives and that you and I have really knockout websites now that are just like incredible and beautiful. And <laughs> y'all, you need to go to Ashwini's website because it is the most <laughs> colorful and vibrant and happy place that I've ever been to. I spent a couple hours there this morning, just like looking around and looking at pictures and looking at her art. And it's just like, oh, this is what it feels like to know Ashwini. So I'm really excited to have you here on the podcast today. Thank you so much. That means so much to me. Mm-hmm. It's a uh... Uh, the color, and I'll definitely share more about it and because I'm super excited to be yeah. here. So color aspect is um, also my cultural influence. And um, uh, so I am Ashwini Sadekar. I'm a Seattle-based artist, uh, professional fine artist. I'm originally from India. Yeah. And uh, it's been, um, so this year I'll be celebrating my 11th year in the North America. So wow. It's been such a meaningful journey. Yeah. Congratulations on your 10th year living or 11th year living here. That's that's amazing. That's a long time. Before we, we get into your story, I want to hear if, if someone has never met you before and they've never seen your work and maybe they're listening to this in the car. Um, can you describe what your art is like for, for us? Yeah, definitely. And yes, uh, uh, thanks for offering me this opportunity to share my journey. I hope it will inspire the listeners. And uh, uh, even if you're listening from a car or at your home or you're (laughs) painting and listening to this, I'm uh, just excited that it will inspire all of you. So uh, yeah, my paintings, as um, Stephanie already mentioned, it's very colorful and Mm -hmm. uh, what is that color? Because ultimately you're painting with colors. So paintings are colorful, but then there are aspects of color. <laughs> so uh, I create representational visual art and um, I'm really passionate about a beautiful and harmonious blend of uh, impressionists, rainbow colors, mm-hmm. the full spectrum palette. Uh, and I combine that with a, uh, uh, with a draftsmanship that is uh, uh, coming from the Dutch golden era. So for example, uh, the Rembrandt paintings, um, the draftsmanship of Rembrandt. So uh, in a way, I'm drawing my inspiration from art history and uh, combining, uh, merging them, integrating these two ideas together, which um, I'll be sharing about it. Integration has been a theme of my life. So integrating both the cultures of India and USA, Mm -hmm. and then integrating integrating uh, these two genres from, from art history into making my art. So uh, my paintings are geometric. And uh, that's where I also resonate with you because your paintings are so geometric and, uh, you know, uh, the clear notes of color. It's true. So, uh, yeah, so I, I take that geometry. So, for example, if I'm painting a bird, then imagine a diamond with facets. So I will be making that bird... Um, with the facets of color as uh, pr- giving it a prismatic dimension and each shape of color each geometric shape of color has a meaning and um it conveys something it uh, contributes to that form so i would describe my paintings uh, starting from graphic flat shapes mm-hmm. to uh, achieving the fullness of the form with color modulation it's it's <laughs> really something else looking at ashwini's work the 
the color clarity that you get in your work is it's clear that it's taken you a while to learn and that you're very skilled at it now and that it's it's very masterful and you use a lot of motifs of nature of lots of florals lots of you know botanicals birds sometimes and your own self portraits which are quite lovely if you're watching this episode you'll see some of her pictures on the screen right now and they just I don't know. They have such a, a liveliness to them that is so beyond sometimes. Sometimes I think geometry can be kind of cold. Would you agree that it's just like it's kind of like sterile almost? But your your geometry, it's so. I don't know. It, it has like laughter to it. It has like character. It has like a sense of genuine just like humanity to it that is so different than I think a lot of geometric work that I've seen in the past. So it's it's very cool. You went to Kimberly Trowbridge's atelier, right? Yeah. At yeah. Gage Academy. She is another artist. And I think you can definitely see her influence in your work, especially in your uh, your pieces that you made while you were there in the atelier, which is very cool. Uh, can you tell me about your, your art education? Yeah, definitely. So... This uh, geometry, the piece of geometry is definitely coming from Kimberly. That uh, uh, So my background, my uh, non-art education background or overall yeah. education background is also tripod. And uh, then my art education background is also tripod. So hmm. um, my education, I am an engineer from India. Uh, yeah. I went to uh, engineering college um, did my bachelor's of engineering in electronics and telecommunications and then I went to Canada in Ottawa uh, in the east coast where uh, I completed my grad studies in electronics and telecommunications and I was awesome. working on a uh, thesis um, on 5G networks LTE which mm -hmm. by the way is long-term evolution and I feel like as much it's the long-term evolution of the cell phones and networks, uh, it's long-term evolution of humans also. So yeah, <laughs> <laughs> as we're evolving, you know, as an artist, I'm evolving also. So, mm -hmm. um, and I'm sure, and, and as you mentioned that, you know, previous works versus latest works, uh, that evolution is evident there. So, yeah. So uh, one of the, uh, one of the other pillars of my education is art education that I started with, Kimberly Trowbridge um, at Gage, uh, Gage Academy of Art in the Modern Atelier. And the mm -hmm. third uh, piece of my uh, background is um, I'm a yoga teacher, yoga trainer. I teach um, and uh, yeah, I, I conducted 200 hours yoga teacher training at the University of Washington here in the Seattle. Amazing. So these are the three pieces that I integrate coming back to the idea of integration. Yeah. And I, I would I mean, I would say it's it's an organic journey that's uh, un, uh, that started unfolding uh, to do me as I moved to the uh, United States. Uh, that uh, I had that uh, you know freedom and opportunity of thought here. Uh, that you know, so for the listeners, if you are on the fence or if you are <laughs> if you are like, where am I? What am I doing? I I have a degree in this topic or this subject and then but my passion is this so I would say that it's an integration of uh, it's a compound interest in integration of all your passion streams all your ideas Absolutely. so just reflect upon and get clarity uh, zooming in on to the art uh, art education yeah uh, I was studying um, in Ottawa I completed my grad studies. I got married and I moved to the Pacific Northwest. My husband works uh, at Microsoft. So a uh, techie, another techie. <laughs> <laughs> He's a sweetheart. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I I simply honor. I mean, although uh, I really enjoy, I, I enjoyed my engineering study and everything, uh, but I did not resonate with the uh, work culture. So that's why I hold such an immense honor for people who actually work there and make a living as well as you know they're making something all these softwares that, we, that we're using they're mm -hmm. making it and software is uh anyway so, <laughs> so it's creative I, I, uh, it's, it's creative they're creating something yeah so uh i got married i moved here and i did not have a work permit uh to work in the united states yet mm -hmm. so i applied for that and it was a process it was a process of one and a half years long and during that time, I was like sitting at home, do all alone. I had no friends here. All my friends were either in India or in Canada. Mm -hmm. So, um, and all my husband's friends were busy doing their jobs. So, I was, 
<laughs> it's like, okay, what am I supposed to do now? So I started watching YouTube videos, how to paint flowers. And uh, I, I bought my first uh, art supplies from a local art store. And I, it was like $75. And I was still in that realm of uh, converting the currency from, you know, rupees to uh, US, uh, mm -hmm. USD, US dollars. And I was like, oh my God, I spent so much on art supplies. Now I have to do something with them. With them. <laughs> they're, they're just not lying there. Yeah, so, um, I started watching YouTube videos and uh, uh, painted a whole lot of flower paintings on canvases. And eventually I displayed them at a local coffee shop in Redmond. And uh, nice. someone uh, out there, uh, they saw the paintings and they told me that if you want to be a serious artist, then go to art school. I was like, okay. <laughs> Sometimes it's that simple. <laughs> I was like, okay, I still had time on my hand to actually go to the art school work permit was still uh, in the process. I went to Gage Academy of Art, um, Kimberly, Trowbridge, wholeheartedly with full arms accepted me in the middle of the term. Oh, wow. um, yeah, in the middle of the term. So uh, I started from uh, with her um, from winter term and uh, I really admire her and thank, thanks, uh, like big thanks to her for this opportunity that brought me here. Uh, yeah, so cubism or uh, the uh, modern color is Kimberly's expertise and she bestowed upon her all uh, her knowledge to me. And eventually, I uh, after graduating from uh, uh, the Trowbridge Atelier, the modern color atelier, I met another uh, mentor of mine, uh, mm -hmm. Kamal in California. Uh, so she works in the genre of Impressionism. Can you say her um, name again? Yeah, Kamil Prezwadek. Mm. And uh, so she works in the impressionist, American impressionist genre. Um, she is a student of Henry Henshi, who is a student of Charles Hawthorne in that legacy, yes. ultimately tying back to Monet. And that's that's the reason one of my workshops, color workshops, online color workshops, it's called Monet's Magic, where you learn to paint with a full rainbow color. Oh, that's so cool. <laughs> what, a, what a cool history of art that you have behind you. <laughs> So, I mean, it goes on. It's like evolution long term mm -hmm. because I realized the more I uh, start, it, it's a process that I started enjoying more and more. And I was so curious because non-art background and fully emerging into background uh, art, uh, being an artist, I was so curious about all the uh, historical art movements that I was, I had zero knowledge. Uh, so Kabil, uh, one of my um, mentors, and I studied with her for about two to three years. I still sometimes take workshops with her because it's 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 just fun to mm -hmm. you know connect back to your roots. Uh, and then eventually, uh, I evolved more. I found mentors. Uh, so um, Charles Miano is one of my mentors uh, from Florida, and Steve Houston, and they work in the classical realism mm -hmm. uh, tradition. Um, in the tradition of uh, Rembrandt and Dutch golden era. And so ultimately integrating all these three ideas together, I I call my work as color realism because it, it has that realism yeah. achieved through the lens of color uh, through geometry. So color realism. <laughs> I, I love color realism. That's such a great term for your work. It's It's like it really encompasses everything that you do. That's very cool. Do you, do you remember the point when you were thinking to yourself, I, I no longer want to pursue my engineering work and I want to only do artwork? Was there a, like a catalyst moment that happened there? Yes, yes, definitely. So um, that was during the um, Trowbridge Atelier. So it was a commitment in terms of accountability. Atelier training is a rigorous process. It's mm -hmm. as good as you're doing a, a bachelor's of art, um, yes. which I didn't do. I did a, a bachelor's of engineering. So anyway, so it's like you're pursuing a degree with a mentor, with a master artist who is uh, who is there to you know share all their wisdom with you, all their practices and secrets with you. So in terms of fin finances, as much I have made a financial investment into my grad studies back in Canada, yeah. uh, that was equivalent making an investment there. So that served as an anchor point, but that was one of the elements. The other element uh, that was, uh, you know, predominantly present was my passion. I, I felt such a joy, uh, such a thrill, uh, that from a blank canvas, it's 
making something like you're creating something from literally from nothing just like you know moon phases yes. that it's a blank slate in the sky and then eventually by the way uh, uh yesterday was the full moon day mm-hmm. and it was just beautiful full moon it of was this stunning. Uh, <laughs> yeah yeah and thankfully uh summer time in seattle and we get, we get to enjoy that so <laughs> yeah That's yeah good. so uh so, so that moment was uh that i'm seriously pursuing something uh, i'm studying uh, with this master artist and um, what happened it was one of our, our friends one of rohit's friends my husband his hmm. name is rohit so his friends birthday parties we were invited to that and uh, uh so by the time i was uh, like it was like one and a half years into my artistic journey and uh, like people started like friends and family they started liking my work and they wanted to they wanted uh, something made specifically for them so i did that which i later learned uh, that we call commission mm-hmm. so, yeah. <laughs> uh, and uh, stephanie you also offer commissions i so, do yeah really uh, amazed with your uh, uh, you know business of art skills and you know making that Thank connection you. with people yeah commission is a beautiful creative process where you have that connection with it's uh, so much fun handmade <laughs> Yeah. So yeah, within that birthday party, some uh, so, so uh, one of the friends said, "Oh, uh, can you make this?" Uh, it was their son's birthday or something, and they said, "Can you make painting of two, uh, like two kids, mm, just a generic painting?" And I said, "Okay, I'll do that," and I did that, and they really loved it. And then that was the moment they showed it to their uh, friends, and they um, they're like, "What are you doing?" just just become an artist like we don't need my more engineers yeah and all of them were engineers by the way so <laughs> uh, uh so yeah that was the decisive movement that was when i bought my first easel wow um, i yeah I, until then i like i was i, I was a, i was an engineer i'm more used to working on a laptop on a table so this was the time when i bought my first easel and nice. uh that 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 was the catalyst yeah <laughs> That's pretty remarkable. I I love that for you. I love that someone was like, I want to buy your work. I want you to make me something custom. And it turned into your now full-time job. Is that right? Oh, no, yeah, wait, no. Yeah. You also do, I can't forget about your yoga. You do yoga. You teach it. You went through 200 hours of training for it. I cannot just forget it to not mention it. <laughs> you are also a yogi. Can you tell me about that journey and what how that developed? yeah definitely definitely so uh so i was born into this idea of yoga so perhaps the idea of yoga um you know different uh, different cultures that's my one of my themes also like how can i you know bring best uh, blend best of all the cultures that i have been experiencing because it's, it's an experience so as i uh, born and brought up in india mm-hmm. specifically west central part of india uh, overall whole india it's it's uh, it's a country of uh, yogis and yoginis and practicing mm-hmm. yoga so the idea of yoga is is that integration or is that alignment of uh, the energy of the mind body breath wisdom and bliss um so and what i noticed here after moving here i that yoga is practiced as if uh, within the realm of the physical aspects that postures so uh so and i i enjoyed it like back in india i, I when i say i was born into it that uh, we do practice yoga as postures at the same time there are multiple aspects there is also karma yoga so karma is not just the idea if you do some, something and something happens that like cause and effect or mm-hmm. you know it's more like the action uh, fulfilling the need of the hour or arriving into that moment with all your elegance and you know all your awareness um, all your three brains of of uh, the reptilian mammalian and the neocortex that's what sets humans apart the neocortex yeah you know? yes. so with with all of that you know uh, ev- evolutionary conditioning that we uh, have uh, as well as say cultural conditioning or any kind of that we how we conduct in the world how we interact with the self and with one another so in yoga we have a uh, one of the eight limbs of yoga uh, as described by patanjali the great master is uh, ahimsa ahimsa means that non violence literally translation is non violence mm-hmm. but then how do you practice that how can you be in that state 
throughout the day that if you are a creative, if, if you're making a painting, if you look at it and if you're like, what did I do? I wish I had done something different or, you know, I, I, I'm not there yet. Or, you know, these kinds of idea, the narrative that you're telling yourself, that's a, that's that little violence, you know, that's that idea of violence or himsa that you're doing with yourself or you made a painting. Like I hear people that uh, uh, I painted something and I just threw it out in the trash. I'm like, why? <laughs> you know, it's it's getting yourself, you know, it's whatever you did, it's getting yourself towards in that direction of evolution. It's mm -hmm. So just practicing, it fr starts from within. Uh, so uh, so, you know, how do you narrate all those narratives to yourself? Sometimes I'm like, um, and, you know, I have to do my newsletter as an artist. I mean, I'm sure you can also perhaps relate to this stuff oh, yes. that you, you're doing awesome with this, you know, managing the market business. So, you know, if I didn't do my newsletters, am I like, uh, am I going to like curse myself because of that? Or am I going to give so dramatic. myself a little space? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. So, so uh, this is the idea of yoga that I, uh, or the aspect of yoga that I bring into art and also share with my students and for the listeners also that um, honor where you're at, honor yourself where you're at in your journey or in your painting journey. It could be a whole journey mm -hmm. um, of making the, that decision of being an artist or being a creative in uh, the field of your choice mm -hmm. or it could be that when you're painting, when you're drawing or, or it could be digital art know uh, non-digital traditional media that that journey of completion of that painting um, so yeah find that space uh, so yeah uh, like that I was born into it and then we did rituals and things like that uh, that's how like I feel connected more with the nature that what nature is offering all these five elements of earth water fire and uh, ether the sky and uh, yeah. yeah these are the five elements that we usually offer our rituals and uh, to and then and deities and all of that and different values so uh, yeah that comes in and then the physical aspect and the breath work and all of that they are uh, different limbs of yoga so yeah I did my 200 hours of although I was born into it I did my 200 hours of yoga teacher training from the University of Washington where now I teach mm -hmm. and uh, I got an opportunity to start teaching there then an opportunity came up when um, I could start leading the trainings um, wow. as a trainer so then I completed my uh, 300 hours of yoga teacher training from um, uh, a school in India mm -hmm. back to the roots. So it's it's a whole journey of 500 hours. And uh, yeah, it's just beautiful. They feed one another. You know? Absolutely. I We've been talking for about 20 minutes now. And I, I everything you've told me about yourself, I can see now in your painting. When I look at your florals, I'm like, yeah, a yogi painted this. <laughs> You know, you're like, it is logical, but it is also feeling and um, you make a lot more sense now. <laughs> Not that you were confusing before, but I was just like, yeah, this is super clear. I love how you talk about nonviolence, especially towards yourself. Um, that's ahimsa, right? Yeah. Yes. And that is really important for creative people. I, I know there are thousands of little thoughts that go throughout our heads, especially when we are making something that is totally new and it's a blank canvas in front of us and we paint, we paint and we make mistakes and then we're like, oh, this is the worst. Do I deserve to be an artist? Blah, blah, blah. Like thoughts like that, they show up and learning how to be like, okay, I had that thought and now we're moving on, <laughs> right? And we don't have to make this our personality. We don't have to make this ruin the rest of our days. We can continue with the art making process and that is a really tough lesson to learn, especially if you haven't had any training in it. <laughs> it's 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 good to hear about and it's good to see. We've gone through so many things and I just, <laughs> it's so much fun talking to you. Um, what is, I'm going to go back to my questions here. What is something that you love to teach your art students? Because you are a yoga teacher, but you're also an art teacher. Ashwini teaches classes, you have workshops, you have online mentorship, you have in-person classes maybe sometimes yeah you have a you teach a lot and I love that you love to teach what are some of your favorite things that you teach your art students so first and foremost is a color wheel mm. mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
<laughs> and by the way i have a free color wheel tutorial if um, you folks are interested in uh, grabbing that i'll share that with uh, stephanie heck yeah mm, so so color wheel again uh, as you mentioned like bringing in all these three aspects together that the left brain yeah i mean i hear creative saying that i'm a creative right brain um and then engineers could be like you know analytical left brain but mm-hmm. let me tell you that we are designed to work with all our brains together all of it uh, <laughs> all of it together I, i mean it's fine that they are our aspects of our personality that is um, you know more on the uh, by the way in yoga we have like breath works nadi shodhana or alternate nostril breath is one of that idea where you are bringing in both the brains together hmm. So there's a little mem- membrane that s- separates the skull uh, left and right, but mm-hmm. uh, eventually integration, like we're designed to make uh, the whole brain work. As much on canvas, you are creating, you're also making those choices and decisions from that conscious space. So, uh, you know, like little kids having fun, they're just, you know, uh, splashing colors on canvas and then <laughs> it's just having fun. Yeah. Uh, they don't have to make meaning of what what is that. It's just joy and fun. And I hope that kind of, uh, you know, emotion that my paintings convey to the audience, because yeah, ultimate, what we, what we call in yoga, the state of consciousness, consciousness meaning what is a human as well as what is that, you know that colorless sap within the plant that makes the color of the flower pink perhaps it's a rose or a red rose um, mm-hmm. or what that makes that consciousness making that color of the leaves green so that consciousness so nature of consciousness is bliss is joy so that's what i you know uh, that's the energy that i try to convey through my paintings the joy um, through the, all the colors that i the meaning okay so coming back to the idea of uh, teaching mm-hmm. so my teaching philosophy my teaching methodology is based on organizing logically uh, say for example on a color wheel you have uh, all the colors from starting with yellow orange going towards red magenta and then violet um, going to blues blue greens and back to yellow so it's a full circle it's just like life <laughs> it is just like life <laughs> Like <laughs> life, it's a full circle, and then this cyclic nature of the life is, uh, the rhythm of the life is also evident throughout the season. That's my favorite thing living in the Pacific Northwest that we have clear seasons and color changing mm-hmm. throughout the season. And I'm excited for fall, by the way. So, <laughs> all the warmth. Um, so, uh, so uh, color wheel is my favorite. Uh, tool to teach once you grasp that idea of how colors are moving then you can find and integrate uh, their relationship with one another um so just like you know uh, us humans how we are uh, you know how what our nature is so for example yellow is the lightest light and um, it's uh, uh, it it has its value that is it's 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 a higher in value because it's bright um, it's closer to the white so uh, what is the characteristic or that personality of that color say what are what are the values lightness uh, lightness or darkness or something uh, what is the temperature how warm or cool it is mm-hmm. and uh, uh, what's the chroma the intensity how saturated if you turn your tv screen or computer screen saturation super high your eyes will be like i don't want to see that <laughs> and then if you turn it all the way down it will turn black and white so mm-hmm. that's the chroma intensity so all these characteristics are unique to each paint and when they come together how they respond to something and that's how we make a painting that finding these relationship between these what are the two highest contrast things coming together is that the silhouette of a bird and the sky behind um you no know, that idea so similarly just like relationship between humans that stephanie has her own personality which is just awesome beautiful light easy going and <laughs> you know uh like intelligent and then ashwini has her own personality and how they are connecting and uh, interacting with one another that is creating an experience for all you listeners <laughs> so it's really good yeah. wow you get all that and yeah. a color wheel you should take a you should take a lesson <laughs> yeah. from ashwini that's pretty good <laughs> <laughs> so yeah so we're first starting from color wheel moving on to uh, like sim- uh, moving on to different kinds of palettes uh, say black and white you really work on the values and then uh, understand their relationships as well then zone palette is one of my favorite tutorials mm-hmm. i have a free tutorial on my website if you're interested so under 
Anders Zorn, uh, one of the mm, post-impressionist artists. Mm, like working with red, yellow, and blue, three primaries, but they're muted primaries. Mm -hmm. uh, so instead of blue, it has a, a black instead of blue. And then how do you find that relationship? And moving on gradually to like full spectrum, adding on more colors, and then ultimately painting with that. Uh, so that's what I teach to my students in my private mentorship. That is that uh, uh, long um, commitment mm, that you, you can seriously level up your, uh, you know, color uh, perception. Yeah. That's where I like gradually make you through, take you through all these exercises and then strength and the color perception as we, it's, it's the sunlight that uh, Stephanie and I, we are, uh, you know, enjoying right now. <laughs> we're <bathing laughs> for it. Yeah, we're bathing in it. So the sunshine, it, if it, it's passing through a um, prism or if it's passing through a drop of rain a mm -hmm. drop of water and then it's revealing all those um you know bright hues that we are the wavelength so it, it, within our eyes we have uh, those sensory so ray, as the light falls on the retina it uh, travels back um to all the sensitive light sensitive cones and rods that the millions of them and cones are the one they uh, detect that signal and then uh, send that signal to the brain coming back to the idea of working for the whole brain mm -hmm. <laughs> and, mm -hmm. uh, and uh and then that's how we map that sensation of what we are seeing to a hue um yeah the car is uh, green outside the or the apple is red that's how and imagine these are the available wavelength the spectrum to humans and the other animals or other uh, you know beings uh, that are not humans they have something different you know fishes have dif some different uh, uh, spectrum available and so on so ultimately this idea is so you know sign that that color scientist idea <laughs> Yeah, you you have that scientific element. You understand color from a perspective of science. How you uh, respond to a sensation and call it color, and then ultimately you take that you uh, translate it with the use of pigments on mm -hmm. your canvas, and mm -hmm. you give that experience to your viewer of what you capture through your eyes. You say you take on one on one mentorship students. If someone was a beginner, would this be a good fit for them? Or are you looking for someone who has a little bit of artistic experience underneath them already? Okay, so if I can be a beginner uh, in art from being an engineer, then you can be absolutely a beginner because all, <laughs> uh, you know, all those historical artists that we call masters, they began somewhere. So honor that beginning stage. And um, I would say, I mean, although I'm uh, taking it from the lens of philosophy, yeah, beginning, being a beginner is a beautiful stage to start. And I offer all that support um, to uh, the beginners because I can relate with a beginner that how the beginner mind works, that you have that little bit of fear. Um, at the same time, you have that excitement that you want to do something, uh, hop on this journey. So this program is actually designed to, um, you know, offer you all those tools and all uh, these ideas, uh, all the techniques that can take you from a beginner level to uh, moving to your dream painter. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know? uh, what do you what do you want to do? And it can be any subject matter as well. That if you want to paint landscapes, or if you want to paint like still lives, or uh, florals, or birds. Once you have that knowledge of color, mm -hmm. I would say you can just tackle any subject matter um, with that. Uh, you know, backup strength, strong knowledge. It's true. It's true. Once you get the fundamentals down, you the world is your uh, oyster, as they say. <laughs> and it's, it's very good. And so if you are a beginner and you're hearing Ashwini and you're like, I want to learn from Ashwini. This sounds great. You should absolutely contact her because she'll teach you. She'll teach you everything and how to keep your, your mental state in check. Just, yeah. It's a win-win. <laughs> it's a win-win. <laughs> um, <laughs> This is so good. Um, okay, so let's switch let's switch tracks a little bit. I want to hear about instead of teaching, I want to hear about your I don't know your current artistic aspirations. Do you have any like big goals with your art that you're going towards? I feel like you're always working on some project or another, and I want to hear about them. I am excited to share. Mm -hmm. 
so as much i dive deep with the help of all my mentors uh, definitely yeah. uh, kimberly trobridge huge on art history her art history knowledge and hands on experience like she uh, she has visited the museums and she is uh, she she has studied those pieces in person so that that is a beautiful passion that she infused in me and anywhere i go now on trips i'm like okay where is the art museum i want to go there and check mm-hmm. out what's Me what is uh, on the sh- is, is, yeah, so, so um and yes and uh, my husband um engineer he has to come with me and uh, take my photographs uh, with the art Natural. and also hear my you know hear my stories and analysis on that piece of art <laughs> uh yeah so i'm in a way i'm training him as well um uh, exchanging ideas so so my uh, uh artistic aspiration uh, going forward is uh, first of all it's naturally happening that i'm in um, like integrating all three aspects of uh, this impressionist color and uh, the traditional realism into color realism mm-hmm. now i want to uh artistically travel to india so, so yeah. yes i was born and brought up there but then art wasn't a part of my bringing up um uh, i mean i wouldn't say that it was a little bit because i remember uh, winning like 100 rupees which could be i don't know one cent or something i uh, uh, winning a 100 rupees prize with which i opened my very first bank account uh, so it was my uh, my mom's office uh, they held a painting competition and i uh, painted a balloon man a balloon seller who was selling balloons to little kids that's so, so cute that. and you won a prize <laughs> yeah i won a prize 100 rupees one cent perhaps or even lesser but then it it what mattered was um, just that beautiful feeling that i created something and it, it got recognition and then uh another uh, memory of me making art other than my academics in, as a kid was uh, i think i painted an apple and uh, in watercolor and my teacher uh, just held it in front of the class to show uh, to uh, all the other students that uh, oh look at her you know <laughs> like she did it so skillfully i i remember that moment and i remember uh, losing a few friends um, there in that no moment way. <laughs> oh, there's and something we were, we were so little. There's so something little. wonderful about being recognized for your art, especially at a very young <laughs> age. But there's also something tricky about the social situation of being recognized <laughs> for something that you do that is interesting yeah. that they might also want. I, I mean, I, it was more like you know, if we were so little. I don't know, third standard, five years age, or so, so so young. I mean. Yeah so we were little but then it was it more like a fun part <laughs> so that those were just a few memories of my, me making art uh, so now i want to travel india mm-hmm. um travel to india and artistically look at all the architecture because subconsciously it shaped my vision my artistic vision Absolutely. because uh, we have such a uh, such a rich uh, heritage and history that uh, uh, all the emperors and uh, their the castles and all those architectural uh, buildings then all the carvings on the temples uh, these yoga poses that now we have uh, now we see on the books or on social media they are carved in stone uh, on the temple so i want to visit that then um, i want uh, i i have been doing research on who are these indian artists uh, so raja ravi verma is one of the indian artist um, who painted uh, uh beautiful mythological so again this rich history uh, contains mythological stories that have been passing um, on or uh, you know uh, passing on to generations to generations in the form of story in the yeah. form of symbols so ramayana and mahabharata are the two great epics that uh, have these beautiful stories of uh, uh, uh you know how uh, this uh, uh, how this person named sita that was abducted by a an evil a devil and mm-hmm. then you know uh, how can i narrate that through my paintings uh, with the uh, fusion of this color and realism that i have the aspects of nature and also human being that one of the aspect of nature um as well as i'm influenced with bollywood uh, a lot bollywood, bollywood is so is great, great. <laughs> 
I mean, I breathe Bollywood. I breathe Bollywood. By the way, I also teach Bollywood dance. If anyone, no way. It's, it's fun. It's fun. Like it's just you in a fun way. You um, you're working with your energy, calorie, and then it's just fun. You can give expressions. So yeah, with that influence of Bollywood and the, like the drapery, the sarees, the mm-hmm. you know the clothing and all jewelry. uh so i feel like i can have this narrative uh, uh, painted this uh, so these are my aspirations and in a way and i perhaps you can also speak to this that an artist is continually evolving it's that lte long term evolution seeking new inspiration and challenges experimenting with techniques and subject Absolutely. matter um so the work that now started to feel more authentic and meaningful to me is uh, like combining all these aspects yeah Wow, you are going to have such a transformative experience going back. I think you're, it's going <laughs> to like you're already blooming, but it's just going to be like, wow, <laughs> I I'm so excited to see what your artwork looks like after you travel back to India. I think it's going to be outstanding. You know, you, you talk about how all these things influence you. And we were chatting, you and I, um, just on Instagram the other day, and we were talking about how we we're both reading this book called The, the Artist's Way. It's such a great book. It tells you about how to reestablish your creativity. And in one of the chapters, she talks about influence and how, you know, everything you do is influencing your creativity and how you see things and how you want to make things. And when I say everything, I truly mean everything. It's like, oh, there's a rock on the ground over there and that's influencing you. And, you know, what you eat is influencing your creativity and how you're making your bed in the morning is influencing it. And when you choose to do these bigger gestures, like returning to India after many years, probably, it's going to really transform your creative self. I I don't know. I'm excited for you. This is really cool. <laughs> this is really fun. Um, what are some ways that you actively feed your creativity? You you watch a lot of Bollywood, you do yoga, you do this and this and this, you have a million plants behind you. I'm counting like three or four just behind you in this camera right here. <laughs> I am also a plant person. Um what are what do you what are things that you do that feed your creativity that aren't painting? Yeah, that's a beautiful question. And uh I want to yeah, I want to go back to the book uh because um mm-hmm. from your podcast i learned about this book julia uh, cameron's uh, the artist way and yeah the uh, that's what resonated with me that it's uh, it's not a full stop or it's not a destination that it's journey that matters all these moments and how you are arriving into each and every moment mm, and that that becomes your expression and uh, perhaps like if i were to be like okay an engineer is my identity then i wouldn't have given uh, this opportunity to myself to like experience something now sometimes like you know focus is one thing and then uh, what like you know when you reflect deeply and find that inner voice is your intuition call it intuition or uh, the neocortex yeah. or guidance so that's where that book is uh, really meaningful and uh, that's one of my favorite activities when i'm not doing art i love reading brain uh, science brain research book because oh, ultimately yeah. that's that's the channel that we are channeling our mind and our expression through a mind body breath complex how that works and human beings being the complex nervous system as compared to plants uh, but plants they do have uh, emotions trust me like i i love speaking with my plants when i'm watering them mm-hmm. uh, one of my uh, one of uh, uh, my relatives from india they told me to sing to plants so i started singing to plants when i'm and then i i feel relieved like i feel a dopamine release in my blood stream rather than cortisol running and rushing for yeah. uh, any you know uh, that's lovely like in triggering any f- fight or flight response so and then i don't have to worry what kind of singer i am i'm just singing naturally <laughs> so uh so reading artist books mm, listening to podcast uh, definitely brain science as well as uh, uh, so you're listening to artist podcast because that feeds me i feel like as artist uh, and then we have this uh, now i think the world is evolving like 
what I experienced in my third standard, uh, like I lost some friends, I would, I would say rather here we are gaining friends. Like when we are collaborating, we are co-creating, we're gaining friends. I really enjoy uh, like learning about what, what my artist friends are doing and how they are. Because sometimes what I'm experiencing as a problem or as an issue in my artistic journey they might already have experienced that and found a solution. So mm-hmm. listening to podcasts also helps there. And yeah, uh, I just like your podcast is so light, easy going, as well as packed with a uh, lot of action steps and a lot of oh, wisdom yeah. there. Then uh, Bollywood, watching Bollywood movies, comedy movies mm-hmm. uh, is my favorite because it's again, uh, dopamine and Anand the Might, all those feel good chemical release. Uh, gardening. Uh, so I started collecting house plants during pandemic, um, and now I have more than fifty. I started propagating them. Just taking care of plants. It feels like a self care routine that I'm also taking care of myself in turn. Mm, then uh, nature and yeah, uh, like planting. I started planting bulbs. I learned a lot about uh, the plants in the Pacific Northwest. And yes, uh, the purpose behind planting bulbs was so that I can paint them. I started uh, planting flowers in order to paint flowers. <laughs> You're working ahead of time. I like it. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so yeah, like aimless play. Sometimes just aimless play that. Uh, random belly laughing or uh, like no agenda because it just gets you in that flow state and boosts that uh, it gives insight mm-hmm. um, and yoga mindfulness meditation is, is, is a big part of that also uh, sometimes just chatting with people connecting uh, going to uh, like uh, openings of my friends uh, like artist friends or mm-hmm. openings so it, really fun. giving myself a little space from myself uh, you know for that creativity for to foster and nurture that creativity uh, away from being creative yeah mm-hmm. <laughs> lately my favorite non-creative thing to do to feed my creativity is going on really long walks I've been doing hour hour and a half long walks where I go and I put on an audiobook or a podcast or sometimes just nothing at all and I just walk around my neighborhood and it's been Every time I come back from the walk, I'm like, okay, I can paint now. <laughs> I can make something and it feels really good. And that's been one of my favorites lately. But I like your answers. I'm going to start singing to my plants. I, I like that. <laughs> yeah, <That's>... uh, yeah. <laughs> it's fun. Yeah, I'm really curious about learning different ways that how, uh, you know, uh, how the listeners are, you know, working through this. What are their creative activities other than creating in the studio? <laughs> Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. it's it's good so say you um you ever have a day where you're just like I cannot paint anything today I don't want to look at my art I don't want to look at my business I don't know what to do I feel the creative block do you ever have days like that where you're creatively blocked yes yes so honestly uh, the very first creative like honestly when I started my creative journey my art journey is um, going to the atelier I was like all in for it, just like little kids, super excited and fully into it. Like there wasn't a day that I didn't feel like painting. It was like, it became a nature, a second nature. And then I experienced my first creative block ever. So the last time I visited India was in 2019 before pandemic. Uh, So 2019, just uh, before the lockdown, we managed to come back here. Mm. So uh, back in India, like it was meeting friends and family and uh, like eating lots of uh, tasty food, uh, going to different places. That's where my journey, uh, my research on like the Indian architecture and her- cultural heritage began. I went to Jaipur um, in the state of Rajasthan. It's a northern state where mm. the, this uh, legacy of empress and uh, the palaces they built is there. So I also have a I have a two part video on YouTube my YouTube channel that I made uh, showcase like just sharing my um, journey of how I experienced that uh, all the palaces so if you're interested in uh, like looking at India through my lens you're welcome to check that out on YouTube so after all of that uh, action lot of action packed yeah trip, after all of that action I moved I, I came come came back to the states. And that's the season of hibernation, winter, mm-hmm. <laughs> in the December, uh, uh, sorry, uh, early January, um, late December, early January. So then after uh, 
after coming back with all the gloomy clouds and the weather and i started feeling lonely i was missing my family mm-hmm. and uh, i didn't feel like painting at all like nothing felt right to me at that time like i had so many project ideas so many uh, halfway through done projects that i could work on but i didn't feel like lifting a paint brush or working on that so like i i uh, like i kept just talking with my family for like 2 hours and then there's time difference because when it's morning here it's their night and mm-hmm. um, uh, so yeah that was something and i i actually expressed that that through a video that i made on youtube so i like how to get over your creative block and how i got over that how i got over that was with painting birds because it comes with the symbol of freedom they mm. can fly they are little they are small i mean there are big birds also but i painted goldfinches uh. Uh, because goldfinches <laughs> are the one that uh, that that visit my backyard so mm-hmm. i started uh, painting a series of three paintings little 8 by 10 small goldfinch painting although they're the 8 by 10 is also uh, bigger than their actual life size goldfinch they're being, little being. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so uh, if i painted that in that super geometric idea like one shape of color next to the other shape of color and a bird emerged out of that and i painted three of them different angles different position so that something helped me come out of my creative block and to conclude what helped me was uh, painting smaller so that i was not intimidated that i have to oh my god i have to do this much i have to climb this huge mountain i would rather like get to the base camp and feel contained feel mm-hmm. safer feel satisfied feel confident regain that lost confidence and regain that centering grounding feeling and then uh, go back to training myself again to climb that mountain so that was the idea so even now when i feel like okay i don't feel like pain this is the week uh now that i'm juggling or uh, working with these tasks of managing the business side mm-hmm. and i'm curious how how you do that as well so managing the business side that incorporates um, posting on social media writing newsletters so as an artist you're playing so many different roles um mm-hmm. is, is you are an actor uh, that you're playing different roles in your life as an artist so you make uh, and then the second idea is making paintings and the third idea is framing and preparing them for like showcasing uh yeah so as i'm doing that so, uh, when i don't feel like painting i am into that you know analytical get the business done uh, side that uh, okay how about to working on a newsletter mm-hmm. so that i have it scheduled and uh, then i'm uh, i have more space to work on my art mm, nowadays like i, I have been like feeling deprived of energy to post stories on instagram i'm like okay that's taking a lot of energy and time so i'm not posting as much stories and i'm in a way i feel not connected with with my people with people following me because when i post stories what is that story it's some update or uh, something that is going on that's mm-hmm. happening some kind of inspiration some kind of little tip and then i feel connected i get responses on that story and now it's been like a month that i haven't posted stories but then I'm like Ashwini. It's okay. It's okay. It's okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. Center yourself. Find that base camp, and then start climbing again. Do you? Uh, ever, yeah. 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 Do you ever feel that you get? I I feel this way sometimes. Um, that you get burned out on different aspects of your business at a time. So right now, I feel very burned out on posting to social media. I posted maybe three times in the last month, and no stories. I'm, I'm right. <laughs> right like you were describing um and i've been painting a bit in the background but i haven't been sharing much and then sometimes i go to sections where i'm just like i don't want to paint anything and then my website looks amazing and the podcast is doing great and i'm working on all the stories and like i go through like these um i don't know they're like moon phases of wanting to focus on one thing versus another do you ever feel like that definitely the burnout and like there are ways there are rules and tools rather tools to make yourself burnout proof and it's just like as an artist you are working on the skill set to take your art from say flat shapes to full forms mm-hmm. so i think this is a skill set that you develop uh, that you continue developing as an artist um you, as you're juggling these different walls sometimes all of them just, just they're dropped on the ground and then yep. you're like oh, oops oops uh i feel like Um, so in yoga i can relate it to yoga so for example you may uh, be familiar with the idea of om 
chanting of om um, yes. the symbol the hum of the universe so what is om there are four uh, stages again coming back to the cyclic nature of life so it's a sound a a is starting from the belly so ultimately the whole sound is vibrating your you know cellular structure renewing that energy so a starts from the belly it's the belly sound uh you uh, the a uh, sound a uh, you uh it starts from uh, the chest so it's the chest sound so from ground you're coming up ground up ma is the sound that mostly throat and it's vibrate at uh, the nasal area the face area and then when you're doing this uh, there's there is space so that is that idea of making yourself burn out through that offering that space and most of the times like you know we are so excited to do things mm-hmm. and as well as we have so many things on the plate that we are in that uh, beginning middle end stage and after something ends we are not offering enough space perhaps to ourselves to rejuvenate that energy that's where the burnout may come so how is that space so now sometimes that space for me looks like a little drawing Mm-hmm. you know just a little drawing that i don't want to share with anyone i just do it i just want to do it for myself and um, let it be sometimes that space like just going into your little cave and uh, cut out from social media cut out from anything watch bollywood movies or speak with parents in india or connect with friends uh yeah so i feel that in fact i started my youtube channel uh in the pandemic because i had all the time at hand i uh, i learned editing videos and everything that's where i admire you because your consistency uh, to produce this podcast to uh, work with uh, you know creatives uh, invite people as well as uh, share your insights edit them because it's it's it takes energy it takes effort it, it takes does. time So how how do you do that because like I I produce about I don't know 8 to 10 videos and now I switch to doing live streams because I don't have to like live streams is not there so I don't have to like <laughs> you know edit, edit them <laughs> so how do you do that yeah <laughs> gosh well usually I will record a podcast like we're doing right now um and then immediately like right after i press end record I, i edit it right then because it's fresh in my mind and i don't have to think about what happened to the past so like i don't have to relearn what happened during the podcast because when i'm talking i remember oh, okay i need to edit out that part where i repeated myself 10 times because i couldn't pronounce the word progressive for some reason or like <laughs> that's an example <laughs> and then so instead of like waiting a week to edit it i do it immediately and so i am um, it's fresh it's fresh in my mind so that takes out some of the energy it takes to you know do it but i will have one day a week where i'm like monday is my podcast day so i'm recording and editing making the youtube video and scheduling it my Number one tip if you're ever going to make something that has a lot of content to it is getting ahead of schedule. If you can make one now and two for later, that's great. If you can have five like in the docket ready to go and so you, the one podcast that you're making is for next month because you have four others ahead of you, you're going to feel a lot less stressed and if you need to take a week off, you can do that. Right? So it's not like your deadline is tomorrow, instead your deadline is like 3 weeks out and that feels really good. But also, if you have a lot of content you want to make and you're making YouTube videos all the time or you live streaming and you're just not feeling it, the people who like your content are going to be a lot more forgiving to you than you think they are about you not producing something every week. And if you feel like you're getting overwhelmed with how much you're making, like if one podcast episode a week is too much for you, go to every other week. Go to once a month. Like for, scale it way back and that is how you're going to recover your sense of delight in making it that you had when you first started, right? And it's going to help you find your rhythm again. And taking a break from it, taking a pause from it is totally acceptable. A lot of people think if I stop posting every day on social media, I'm going to have to start over, right? That that thought of like I'm going to get behind. I'm not going to be up to date with things. And it's just not true. That's an excuse that people say, say to themselves so they don't take a break. and therefore the quality of their content is low because they have only so much energy to put into it and it's just a vicious cycle and that's how i keep on it so i schedule one day a week for 
each item. So it's like Mondays are for podcasting and also for my website. And I just balance the time, however. Other days are for painting. Some days are for streaming. Some days are for a day off. Some days are (laughs) more painting. Like it's just you schedule your time so that it is balanced for you. That's lovely. I love that. Uh, Yeah. Uh, so you reminded uh, so my takeaways three takeaways from this are uh, like do it now right now if not now then when (laughs) so Uh it's it's lovely that you immediately when it's fresh in your mind that you're going for it and uh, edit it and it's ready Um, and it's that dedicated time you have for this uh, Mm -hmm. it's it's just beautiful and I also want to give shout out to Brittany here because um she uh, taught me this idea of creating a content calendar and uh, um, like strictly Genius. sticking to the routine and you brought it back. So thanks for that. Mm-hmm. Uh, because sometimes, so I, this is where I, I, I'm in the process of finding a balance, a state of equanimity that I just love the structure and format a lot. That keeps me, um, that keeps me motivated and as well as that keeps me um so that I can enjoy all different aspects of who I am I and what I love to do, like yoga and um, making paintings and all of that. But at the same time, with structure and format, I just enjoy a week of freedom. Like I'm like, okay, I don't want any structure uh, in this week. And I just want to do things randomly as they naturally come. Uh, and then once I give myself freedom, then you know, coming back onto that structure is really important. Otherwise, you know, it can just... Uh, it can just be like mind changes and then mm-hmm. not being on schedule or uh, okay just in your in my mind that oh I have to do this but I haven't done this and like that overwhelm and ultimately burn down so love that idea of creating that calendar and sticking to it I yes I I learned that from Brittany and then it was kind of enforced I took a a I don't know if you know this about me but I'm a perfectionist and um <laughs> I love it when things are perfectly done. And so I took some coaching from uh, Nicole Baker and she kind of reinforced the the content calendar or the, I guess the, the life calendar that is your week and you break down your week into kind of blocks. So instead of being like 8 a.m. every Monday morning, I'm going to work on the podcast. It's like in the morning on Monday, you're going to work on the podcast And then in the evening on Monday, you're going to work on your website. And, you know, on Tuesday evenings, that's when you paint and blah, blah, blah. But she, she had this like little caveat for people who are like you and I, who are high high achievers, right? And who don't take enough breaks. She's like, if you don't have any work to do on your podcast and it's Monday morning, instead of like filling it with something else, you're not going to do any work. (laughs) So even if you... Like, if you don't have anything to do and you're like, I am ahead of schedule, I am not going to do, I'm not going to go work on my website instead, I'm or I'm not going to go paint. Instead, I'm just going to take time off and do one of my hobbies or go on a walk or just be within myself, maybe write a letter to a friend or something. And that, that mind shift change, it was like a really big deal for my relationship with rest and being able to kind of keep my consistency going strong it's like okay like the other thing is like if you are not feeling like I want to work on my podcast on Monday morning and you're like I have an episode ready so like I could take time off Hmm. okay so instead of on Monday I'm gonna work on it I'm gonna instead work on it tomorrow instead of doing that you're just gonna be like I'm gonna work on it the next time it's Monday (laughs) if I need to take time off then you take it off and you know, you, you have bills to pay and you have things like that. So you, you do have to like, you know, keep yourself responsible. But if you're like just one time, great. When it becomes like three times off, then you need to actually look at yourself and be like, do you still want to do this? <laughs> right? Yeah. Like you need to be honest. Like, is this serving you still? Is this creating energy within you? Is this feeding you? Is it worth your time? Then, then you know, that's a whole nother conversation. <laughs> but, you know, <laughs> When you when you have opportunities to rest, you need to take them, and that's what's going to keep your creativity going and your inspiration to work on your your Instagram page and your website and your mailing list and blah 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 blah. Oh, so many things, <laughs> all the hats, all the hats. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's, it's it's beautiful that uh, uh, what you mentioned about you know twice 
it's fine and uh, the third time it happened okay time for reflection so reflection. i read this book uh, by james clear atomic habits it's, oh it's, it's so good, good. <laughs> so what he mentions in that book is um, okay you are developing a habit you are developing a routine if you skip that once okay fine if you skip that twice okay fine find a way to get back on track after skipping it for two times because if you're skipping it for the third time then it's a building of a new habit a new routine yes so i was like oh yeah wisdom <laughs> atomic habits is a fantastic book we read it for art book club here on the podcast and highly recommend you pick it up listener it's it's so good <laughs> Um, it's such an yeah. easy read and it's uh, such a, um, I mean, it, you can just finish the book and then there are, it's packed with action steps. Yeah. Yeah, it's great. Uh, speaking of routine, I only have a couple more questions for you. Um, but what is your typical day in the studio look like for you? You're like, it's the morning. It's going to be an art making day. What does that look like? What's your schedule? Yeah, as, uh, as, uh, as you were sharing about, uh, you know, uh, the content, uh, calendar or general creativity calendar let's call it creativity calendar creative yeah. calendar so uh, you know monday being your uh, podcast day so what i realized that um i used to have days before but now i have blocks within the days and mm-hmm. they are like uh, it's like i can play games with those blocks mm-hmm. mostly are structured and there is some flexibility so i'm a early bird um and that habit formed when i was as i was a kid uh, back in school because my school was a morning school 7 o'clock so i had to get up by 6 and get ready and go to school and then um, so that's how the habit formed so 7 to 1 o'clock uh, used to be my school i came back home had lunch and uh, then i had all the afternoon to do my homework and by by evening when my parents came back home from their work uh like i could just go out and play and i feel like some subco- subconsciously that is happening even now yeah so i um so i get up by 5:30 5:15 5:30 and then um i do some kind of movement um so, so yeah that was uh, this was another like little artist block that i was recovering from an injury a hip and knee injury so like i couldn't stand a lot to paint mm. as much so i used to like do see things so anyway so recovering from that so strengthening and uh, yoga like yoga overall so that's a part of uh, my routine and that also gets me centered so 6 to 7 is that time is that block where i get to do either yoga or i teach a yoga class sometimes um, it is a way to like stay have that energy so as you wake up in the morning you have naturally have that high level of adrenaline and cortisol the action hormones that are rushing through the blood stream so how do you channel that that's like you know uh, like if you go for a walk or if you look into your phone and start responding to emails that's also part of that action you know hormones rushing through uh, running through the blood stream so uh, so 6 to 7 yeah that block is um, or rather 6 to 8 that is the block where i do movement any kind of meditation mm-hmm. uh, because as i teach my students uh, yoga in the yoga teacher training so you know uh, preach what you te- teach yeah. that idea it also gets me centered so um 6 to 8 movement meditation getting ready for the day 8 to 9 is um, you know breakfast time mm-hmm. yeah uh, and then 9 is when i actually start my work block so 9 to 12 is a work block within that block some again flexibility mostly i find going for painting uh, that also depends on how am i i'm fe- physically feeling on that day so mostly that 3 hours of block is uh, broken down into one and a half hours one and a half hours um, so it, it, when i am like into that painting i just don't realize like 2 hours have passed and i haven't um, uh, i didn't drink water b- within that time so that's mostly morning time is painting mm-hmm. 12 o'clock i have lunch mm-hmm. uh, 12 to 1 lunch and then after lunch naturally rest and digest happens uh, you know by, uh, the body shifts into parasympathetic so i'm uh, i'm finding that natural rhythm to work with the physiology and work with the biology mm-hmm. so when the, uh, the rest and digest response happens um, 
then at that time i can do something uh, that is not as analytically heavy then i can just go on to my website and find a few things that i can alter or shift or add something or uh, write a social media post or like do something that is business related for one hour and then from uh, say 1 to 2 to 30 Three o'clock. I again get get uh, energetic. So from three to five, that is another block, two hours of block, that I can make a painting or a drawing. Um, so actual art making. So this time of one to three is flexible for uh for either taking a nap, not two hours nap, but say one hour nap. <laughs> okay. Or uh, doing like business related stuff or replying to the yoga related emails also. or sometimes just watching a movie one to three or uh, yeah again nap then five o'clock i actually like stop there uh, because if i just continue sometimes it happened that eight o'clock and i'm painting my husband is calling me for dinner and i'm like oh no i just have to do this one little stroke and then one little stroke gets into like thousand little strokes and i'm uh-huh. like ultimately frustrated why did i do that i should have stopped <laughs> so i'm like okay make a hard stop you know mm-hmm. so five six uh is that hard stop i have that buffer of one hour and 6 o'clock then i would do something again physical like if it's not raining i would go for a walk or uh, just do a little bollywood dance to shake off that uh just shake off that energy and rejuvenate um or read a book and that that's that's like that's it um uh, then uh 7 o'clock water the plants so on 8 o'clock have dinner Yeah. This is the structure that I uh, operate my operating system into. <laughs> yeah, I so I would say uh, to the listeners like you know there might be several different we are like unique expressions of um, you know this consciousness. So we each have like a unique rhythm. Now there might be some listeners who resonate with being an early riser. Some might be uh, a night owl and that's okay. Mm-hmm. Uh, give yourself permission to honor where you're at and what is your natural rhythm. some might be the third bird that's like you know in between that early riser and uh, night owl so i would say find out your natural uh, circadian rhythm how what are the best of times that you operate efficiently and you feel energetic and um, that you feel doing something and uh, there is actually a test called meq test that you can take it's available online uh, google guru you can google it uh, meq sure. test I uh, um uh, answer some questions uh, and uh, uh, the test will offer you the optimal time and offer you the result uh, that what is that natural circadian rhythm and how efficiently you can work within those hours. So my my key as uh, an early riser, which is in alignment. Yeah, I would say just work with your natural, uh, you know, rhythm and natural uh, honor that. And if you wish to alter. take one degree shift at a time don't force yourself into some doing something that is mm-hmm. radical um so you, again you don't want to work against your biology but with it um yeah i love that that's a what a great day <laughs> that ideal painting day that's that's top tier that sounds dreamy and i i love that this is your normal i love that this is what happens for you what a what a fun time <laughs> All right, my my last question for you is what do you got going on next? Do you have any shows coming up? Do you have any classes? What's what's next for you? Yeah, by the way, cl- talking about classes that evening time, uh, that block is also a reserve for classes for live streams uh say from 3 to 5, 3 to 6. Mm-hmm. Um so I um so when I have students and then yeah, Monday Tuesday for one-on-one students between that time. Uh which in a way so working with student finding connection i am i'm such a big fan of uh, this uh, you know how we humans operate that we are teachers as well as students like i i've been in this uh, uh, you know i i in in a, in the shoes of being a student and then in in the shoes of teacher i um, i love watching my mentors how they cultivate a relationship with their students and that yeah. so for example kimberly trobridge a great mentor julia daristidi is amazing mentor i've also learned since i uh, shifted gears and went into realism i uh, took workshops with her uh, then all my mentors looking at them i feel really uh, inspired to be that mentor and in a way it's a relationship that is feeding me as well as i help my students 
they do something and that um, that inspires me in turn so it's a beautiful relation and connection uh, and that's the slot that i offer to my students um and it's again it's flexible um, so for me next is uh, fall classes are coming up mm-hmm. i do offer as um as stephanie mentioned in the beginning that uh, yeah the in person classes they do happen at times so if you want to stay informed about that so um i collaborate with the uh, suwad park or the bond center at uh, the um uh, suwad park peninsula in yes. seattle so uh, i teach uh, so they uh, they work with the theme of uh, preserving nature and birds and creating awareness about these natural resources and how we, we can interact with them again bringing this idea of yoga in alignment how we can interact with the nature and not just have it as a use cause but be a part of it um, consciously so with them i recently um, celebrated the 15th anniversary of the world park audubon center by uh, teaching a bird painting workshop we painted the stellar j cool stellar j is a blue bird uh, that you might um, encounter in your backyard it's it's beautiful um, and it makes um, it makes noise <laughs> Is it loud? <laughs> is it chatty? It's loud. <laughs> it is. It, it, it's loud, and it's it's like gah, gah, gah. that's the kind of sound. It makes. Um, it's a squeaky sound, but it's it's a beautiful bird. Mm, yeah. So, um, coming up next, I do have. Um, I also teach uh, painting classes at Volcano Gallery, Labor Temple in Seattle. Yes. So, in order um, to, um, so so if you're interested in taking those classes, uh, all uh, like. newsletter i share all these uh, ideas in my newsletter so that you can um, you know sign up when the opportunity comes up and other than that my um, one on one mentorship is ongoing you can start now so in yoga we have this yoga sutra atha yoga nushasana meaning now atha is now now the practice of yoga so now the practice of art <laughs> you know you can start right here right now connect with me and i'll be happy to share all the information with you and we can curate a program that that helps uh with your goals that you have that dream artist in your mind and beginner experienced artists all are welcome and then i have a um uh exhibition coming up it's called bright and uh, beautiful since uh, the use of bright colors in my artwork bright and beautiful uh happening at the university uh, house in isakwa isakwa is a beautiful mountain town where i live uh, in the outskirts of seattle mm, that's happening um from september all the way to january so you're welcome to join me for the opening day and i'll also share that information via email or if you uh, send me an email i'll be happy to chat with you and other than that i'm hoping an india trip because it's been years that yes. i i visited india so yeah <laughs> friends i will have all the links to everything that ashwini has mentioned uh in the show notes but you can also sign up for her mailing list it is being on your mailing list is so much fun like every time i open one of ashwini's emails it's just like yeah this is where the colors at this is a good time <laughs> they're informative and they're fun and i highly recommend Like why get why get emails from a big box store when you could have emails from an artist? Just saying, it's pretty cool. <laughs> I am been so glad to talk to you today here on Freshwork Podcast. Thank you for chatting with me, Ashwini. Thank you, thank you so much. And uh, coming back to the newsletter idea, I know that it's the artist who is it's me who is writing. It's no one is writing mm-hmm. for me. It's like me sharing on my thoughts and. ideas with you so it's a one on one direct connection so uh, yeah it's it's lovely to stay in touch with the newsletters and thanks thanks so much for having me on this show i'm i'm thrilled i'm happy and i hope the listeners enjoyed this and they found um, a lot of gems to take away from this podcast and action steps to incorporate in their creative journey if you have any questions connect with all both of us we are there for you mm-hmm. Absolutely. All right, friends and foes, I'm going to sign us off here. Thank you for listening and we'll catch you next time. Goodbye. <laughs>